Okay, so um, this is going to be a fairly interactive session to get us thinking a little bit about the world of investment and capital and to see how that kind of fits into where you yourself are as an organization along that spectrum of funding, but also where your um, entrepreneurs that you support are and to just have a lively uh, discussion on what you can do to get more investor ready, how to build investor connections, etc. So everybody, I think I've had a chance to speak to most of you, but just a quick uh, brief. I'm Sana, I'm from Spring, we're based in Vancouver. Um, the bulk of what we do is around investor readiness training as well as other ways to support and grow and scale impact businesses. I'll be joined today by some program partners, including Pamela of the Miller Center, Paul from uh, Vilgro, Paul, um, Banks from Uncharted, and hopefully Cal's from um, i to i can stay for a little bit and share some of her insights. This is just, I'm sure some of you have obviously seen this, if you're in the more actively in the impact space, Bridges is, has this great resource and report on the spectrum of um, traditional all the way to philanthropy, and I did hear some of these um, points come up in your conversations around is it impact first or finance first um, and kind of just figuring out what's going to be relevant for the entrepreneurs that you support at what stage you know what types of capital come under that is a key sort of element about even determining like depending on who you speak to you have to know your audience just as you do with anything so you have to tailor the language, etc., and speak to them um, in a way that makes sense. And just for the cohort members, we're going to be sharing the slide deck, and it has tons of additional resources as well. So just so you um, can see that, it was helpful to kind of showcase where people, especially founders, might be along the spectrum of their growth um, and the types of capital. So at that early stage, it's very likely to be more so, especially when we're thinking about equity, more angel investors, friends and family, high risk, high return, potentially high loss, etc. types of capital further along more uh, venture investors and then potentially other but this is for a more sort of growth scale type of business. It's not necessarily relevant for all types of impact ventures. So just something to stew on. So what I asked our program partners to do, and we have Vilgro, uh, Pamela from Miller Center, and Banks of Uncharted, is to share a little bit about how in their own spheres they are furthering this conversation on how they get their cohorts and entrepreneurs investor ready and how they're cultivating investor networks. Uh, very quickly, this is um, how we uh, focus our, fo uh, the, our social entrepreneurs and helping them become investment ready. We have what we call the justifiable ask and it's made up of four things. And so going through our program, no matter whether they're going through our three-day program or our nine-month program, um, we're, we're focusing in on each of these areas. And so the first thing is, how much funding do they need? And so we're diving into, okay, so what's the funding cycle they're looking for, looking at, okay, what are your operational expenses, your OPEX costs for that? But then also thinking, okay, in the next 18 or 24 months on that funding cycle, what do you want to be doing to grow your business, to strengthen your business? And we call those things strategic initiatives. And we, think, uh, and we help them think through those strategic initiatives, one to three, no more than three, and what the costs of those are. And then that becomes their funding amount. Then the second thing is what type of capital are they looking for? Um, we've been talking about different forms of capital. You just saw Sana's slide. Um, and more and more, we're actually seeing uh, blended uh, stacks of capital. So it's not just grants or debt or equity or um, you know, variable payment obligations and other things. It's a, you know, $20,000 to do an impact measurement study of grant funding. It's you know, $100,000 of doing working capital, et cetera. So working through the, um, the decision points about this, because as you know, every form of capital has different impact on their business. And so they need to be aware of that um, in, in, uh, in when they're thinking about, uh, about this and talking to uh, impact investors. And when I say impact investors, those may be purely philanthropic, but um, 
And so then what are they going to do? What are the use of those funds? Ont uh, investors want to know. So if I give you $500,000 or $10,000, what are you going to do with my money? So being able to be very clear with the investors about what that money is going to do. And then finally, what are the returns? That's been what we were just talking about. What are the social returns? What are the financial returns? It could purely be social returns. But again, you need to be able to, the entrepreneur needs to be able to communicate this clearly to their <laughs> investors. And so how that comes together is we have a template and that basically kind of says, telehealth is seeking $75,000 of grant funding to build a new IT system and expand partnerships that will double clinics in the next two years. It's seeking $100,000 in soft debt funding to cover operational expenses. And this will enable them to serve 200,000 by, uh, people by 2020 and generate an economic. And so you get a sense of, you know, as an investor looking at this, you go, okay, the entrepreneur's done their homework. They know what they need. They thought through this clearly. And so it signals to an investor that the entrepreneur is ready to have that discussion. And then the next piece of that is being able to not just have the 10 or 20 minute discussion with these investors, but what we do is we prepare them to have all the materials, including a due diligence folder, which includes, we have a big due diligence checklist that has an, allows an entrepreneur to go through and make sure that everything an investor is gonna wanna look at um, in consideration of that, of doing a deal is in there. Because if you don't, and we see, you know, these funding cycles can be 12, 18 months, which is really, really painful. And a lot of the reason is because sometimes the investor's not ready, but sometimes the entrepreneur's not ready. So we wanna take the entrepreneur not being ready off the table. So a checklist of, of things that the entrepreneur can do. And then we have mapped out what we call, we have a landscape analysis that we've done of like 400 or 500 uh, impact investing firms. And we've mapped this out in terms of, of the geographies that they, um, that they invest in, the sectors, the types of capital, and then the ticket size. We've been talking about ticket sizes. So, so then when we can work with our entrepreneurs, we'll, allow, we'll be able to tell them, okay, based on how much money, where you are, what you're doing, et cetera, these are the 20 organizations or so that we feel you should be talking to. We're constantly um, building this out uh, and, and such. So this helps the entrepreneurs target. So we help the entrepreneurs get ready to have the discussions, we help them target the right people because a lot of entrepreneurs waste a lot of time talking to the wrong people. We're constantly updating. It's in Salesforce. Every time we find new people um, and we know more about them, we're just constantly uh, okay. updating this. And so our role can be, uh, if we identify some people who want to be, we can refer to you and you Yeah, can I mean, if you guys have, I mean, you know, we know the people we know, but if you guys send us emails and tell us about some new uh, firms and investment funds that are, are popping up because there's always new ones happening in the region, um, let us know. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, for sharing. And just in the vein of what we're doing this week in terms of constant learning, um, looking at even that sort of database, I think it's something as a lesson um, for us to do in our own work. And I'm hoping that you're all getting little nuggets of information that you can practically then go and um, implement in your own situations. So without further ado, Paul from Vilgro. So I'll actually move on from here, but just as a context, we've worked with around 210, 20 enterprises over the last, um, I'd say 17 years. F 60 of them have raised a hundred million dollars all put together, just as a context to get. And India is a very different market. So I don't know that all these learnings are very relevant for you guys, but I think there are some principles here I think we, we might learn from. 70 or 80 of them are just profitable. They aren't scalable and therefore haven't raised capital. 150 of them or around 120 of them have failed, right? And this is reality. So don't worry about that. Some of these will fail, but uh, let's actually work towards actually fostering more of those connections. I just want to pick on where uh, some of the things that Pamela uh, left. Uh, I won't get to point two, which is defining capital needs because you actually articulated that extremely well. One of the things that we actually do is we get downstream investors who are potentially aligned and who are reasonably generous. We have done our diligence of the, the partners in those funds on our investment committee. What it does is it applies a downstream investor lens 
at the accelerator incubator level without conflicts happening. So we understand, and the reason why we do that is because for, as investors evolve in their fund management and raise more and more new funds, each fund has a new priority, right? I'm sure they're building on it, but they create new priorities in each fund that they create. So fund one has had a priority, fund two has built on it, and therefore having that partner at our investment committee is useful. So that's a good practice that we found works, but please make sure that you actually select a partner who is very generous, who is high level of credibility and integrity, and this is not a deal flow for them, right? So keep that in mind. So if you can get them without a voting power, as a voice in the room, we do something called diagnostic panels with each of our companies. We get companies into a room, we get a group of bunch of experts around that functional, technical market and things like that. But in that room is always a potential downstream investor. So we've had always these challenges, entrepreneurs coming back and telling us, hey, am I overexposing my model to a potential downstream investor and therefore is that risky? What we've actually learned along the way is that if you actually do that, you're actually educating the entrepreneur on the risks of the model. And if you didn't, you're then you know, designing a partnership that is likely to be failure, right? So the, the, the good part of actually having investors in that panel is really you're getting a view, uh, investor voice there, because we think certain margins are relevant, we think certain scale is irrelevant, and this disconnect between what entrepreneurs perceive and what in investors want is something that is extremely, extremely critical to align, and we use this as a point to actually align along the way. Uh, we do a lot with respect to providing a piece of our funding to hire lawyers, good lawyers, to help entrepreneurs really negotiate. Business discussions and business valuation conversation is not what a lawyer should negotiate, but the implications of the, some of those clauses, right? Right of first refusal, tag along. I mean, what does this mean for an entrepreneur? What are the implications of it, right? It's so important to hire a good attorney who's done similar deals in the room, and please don't have your lawyer negotiate valuation with the investor. That's the last thing that you should do but the lawyer should support you. And what we do is we fund that component separately. And we fund that because we believe that that capacity is really missing and we have a small technical assistance pool to do that. We also, for a little bit larger round, we actually en engage investment bankers. However, over time, we found that investment bankers want to be involved in much larger deals. So we found that there are a lot of individual consultants who work with investment bankers who are now freelancing, who are willing to do much more smaller ticket size investment race. So we expect the investment banker to do what an investment, ba the, the consultant to do what a banker would have done, but we actually bring in our all our capital connects, investor connects. So they don't need to actually go after, you know, the, fund it's, the funds itself but they actually model the company, the financial models, put the documentation in place and things like that, but we pay for it. And having a good freelance, not an investment banking firm, which is unaffordable for companies, but a freelance consultant working with them. Now the question that we might want to ask is, should the accelerator or the incubator internalize that competency? And should you have one person with that skill set within you? My thinking is if you have 25, 30 companies at any point in your cohort, I don't know whether a one-member team or a two-member team can really serve that. So I think it's important to build a network of freelance investment bankers, which can actually help you, you know, build some of that capital connect and take it forward. Yeah, so the other thing, I think Pamela touched upon it, but I just want to build on that, that last piece there. We are in constant conversations with investors. When they've done a particular deal, for example, there was a company that, uh, investment fund that we were talking to, and they'd done an investment in an English-speaking company, with training blue collared workers. And that investment had failed. And we had another company in our portfolio, which is a similar company, which is looking to raise a deal, uh, to raise capital. And what we learned a lot by exchanging notes was why that wouldn't work and why it would work. And the funniest part was this investor actually pointed us to a competing investor who said, hey, that investor wants to do a similar deal and therefore go to them instead of actually coming to us. Some of these nuanced, um, understanding of where investors are in their journey is very important. So it is important for the incubator, 
the head of that incubator or the partners in that incubator to build a very close relationship to get some of this nuanced, finer understanding, which to a large extent can be templatized. But I think you need to build on it as each of these deals uh, evolve with time. I think that's my, yeah. So uh, I think the, the, the key part here is I think the countries that you all come from, many of them don't have a vibrant ecosystem with downstream investors. And I think the real challenge before us is therefore, if that ecosystem is not vibrant, how do you really now foster capital connects? And I think the template that you used of actually saying, hey, uh, global funds, which countries do you really invest in? And therefore, if that is, there is a dearth of capital, I really think, I mean, one of the ideas that is being explored in Philippines is actually building a local Filipino diaspora based angel investment network. So can you actually move from incubation capital to angel investment capital? And once the deals then now progress, can you actually build a fund uh, on top of it? So I think in countries where that capital is really missing, I think maybe one step or the first step might be building a angel investment network to really foster some of those capital connects. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for sharing. And I'm going to uh, ask Banks to come up and share briefly also his uh, thoughts on investor readiness and how they at Uncharted are helping to facilitate transactions. Sure thing. So I, uh, I do the fundraising for Uncharted, and we get all this pressure all the time to ask, how are we facilitating capital that goes to our portfolio? It's a big question for us when it comes to fundraising. And if you guys our accelerators as well, you will get pressure from your funders who are saying, okay, how are you helping to deploy capital to accelerator or to, to your ventures? And one of the things that I have found that our funders really care about is um, how are we catalyzing that additional capital? And so we began to look at and say, okay, if we look at the amount of capital that we have deployed to our portfolio and then have that on divided by our organizational budget, we can actually figure out the ratio of how much it costs us to do our work and how that actually translates into capital that we deployed. So for example, and this is compelling for funders, we say a dollar that funds uncharted leads to $21 of additional capital that our portfolio gets. And it's been interesting for us to see how that number is compelling when it comes to fundraising for ourselves. So I just say that to you all in terms of your value proposition as an accelerator is very much contingent upon how you are catalyzing additional capital. And so look at different ratios for how you can do that. So for us, it's kind of two just really quick high level things. The first is um, we help entrepreneurs become investor ready. The second thing is we provide access to good investors. So there's two sides of the coin. We, if we just help entrepreneurs become investor ready but we don't provide access to investors, nothing happens. If we provide access to investors, but the entrepreneurs aren't investor ready, nothing good happens. And so our job is to work on both sides of that coin and say, okay, our, how do we get entrepreneurs to become investor ready? And then how do we match them specifically with investors? So on the in preparing entrepreneurs to become investor ready, we have built out a, uh, a tool that looks kind of like the lean canvas, but it's for investment preparedness. I'm happy to show it to you afterwards. Uh, we work closely with our entrepreneurs on all the things that our partners have shared around the ass, type of capital, all of that. We also match our entrepreneurs with fractional CFOs. What we have discovered is that entrepreneurs are great product people, great vision people, they're really good at selling perhaps, but their financial and accounting house is oftentimes not in order. And when it comes to actually deploying capital, we, they need help. And so we match them with fractional CFOs who will work with entrepreneurs over the course of three to six months. On the, on the access to investor side, we have people full time on our team who are, we have really great relationships with investors and who are actually making introductions and then walking with the entrepreneur and the investor through that process of making an investment. Um, so nothing, no brain science here or anything like that. It's not, it's not super complicated, but it just takes a lot of time. And what we have found is that it's hard to evaluate the success um, anything shorter than about two or three years. There's inertia when it comes to taking on capital for our portfolio. And so some of our funders are oftentimes asking us, oh, okay, so you ran a cohort um, this fall of 2018. Actually, we just ran a cohort back in August. And one of our funders has said, so how much capital has been deployed to the cohort so far? And we say, nothing. 
uh, because it's only now November. But if we wait two and a half years, we'll see, we'll see more progress on the way. So summarize, getting entrepreneurs to become investment ready and then matching them with good, good investors. And those sides of the coin are really the key elements for us when it comes to leveraging additional capital. Thank you so much. And just to put on the gender and power lens, I think that one of the issues with the realm of money and capital in general is that it's almost like a closed door room. You either are in the know and you know how things work or you're outside of it. And part of our job in the space is to break down some of those uh, barriers to entry, to increase investor education on both sides, on the entrepreneur side of things, but also on the investor side of things. Um, and so, yeah, as you leave and if you have any takeaways, it, just remember that one as well. I will share very, very briefly in 60 seconds what Spring does in this realm and then we're going to switch and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that each of you are facing in your own um, spheres. So yeah, when it comes to investment readiness, similar to our partners, we run funding roundtables that are segmented into those entrepreneurs who are getting ready to raise money and those who are in the thick of raising money. Um, it is education based in that we you know, walk through the same thing around the ask, the uses, the outcomes of funds, et cetera, and then also start to put them in front of investors. To Bank's point, you also need that full connectivity. So that's a big part of what we do. Um, our education lives in a learning management system, and that's something that then, for the accelerators in the room, that is you know, a conversation we can have about how that can help your individual situations. Um, we set up pitch sessions, investor meetings, mentorship, et cetera. Um, but to what Paul was mentioning, a big part of what we do, and I think my background in banking and finance helps because um, I really believe in the power of capital and money to change and catalyze innovation. And so a big part of what we do and what I love to do is to build those connections with different funders, with different investors, creating um, an angel investment community. Um, one of the initiatives off the side of my desk last year was to build a female um, founder, investor, champions community, particularly to catalyze just thinking around uh, what we could do to move the dial. Um, investor only events, uh, partnering with other networks and really trying to build that ecosystem. Because, yeah, you need all these sort of elements to make the ecosystem work, right? So angel investors and ventures only part of it, but really it's everything. Thank you all for your um, insights and your just openness to having a dialogue on a subject that I think is, again, often very clouded under cloaks and mirrors. It's only for those who know about money, etc. And I think that our job is to... Uh, bust some of that and to make sure that the conversation on capital is one that we have with our founders from the onset, get them to think about money and raising money even before they think they need to raise it because they need to start thinking about being ready. And just, I love the energy around building um, just connectivity in the system because really that whole ecosystem needs to come alive and hopefully you've picked up on some tips and actions and know who to speak to and we're all here for another 36 hours at least. So um, make sure to come talk to us. Thank you everybody for your time, appreciate it. Thanks.